Okay, so this is a tutorial on the pelvic floor. So what we're looking at here is a superior view into the pelvis, and you can see these muscles which make up the pel pelvic floor at the bottom of the pelvis. So I've got the femurs in here because I've included the muscles of the walls of the pelvis. So you've got the piriformis muscles attaching to the sacrum and to the greater trochanter of the femur and you've got the obturator internus muscles which you can see here if I rotate around to the back you can see the uh, tendon of the obturator internus muscle attaching to the femur so those two muscles make up the walls of part of the walls of the um, of the pelvis so the pelvic floor separates the pelvic cavity above from the perineum below and it consists of the pelvic diaphragm and then you've got the perineal membrane and the deep perineal pouch. So the, the word pelvic diaphragm is often used interchangeably for pelvic floor but in this tutorial I'm going to talk about the pelvic diaphragm in relation to two specific muscles and then I'll go on to tell you about the perineal membrane and the deep perineal pouch. So these three structures combined make up the pelvic floor. So to begin with, I'm going to talk about the pelvic diaphragm. So the pelvic diaphragm is this dome-shaped um, set of structures which we're looking down at, and it consists of the levator ani muscles on either side. So you've got this midline raph, this ligamentous midline, where the two halves of the levator ani muscle attach and you've got the coccygeus muscle which is this muscle here so I've just isolated the um, the pelvic diaphragm muscles and you can see the shape of them here it's like this this bowl shape of muscles so ignore this extension up here as the the muscle doesn't actually extend this far up so just bear that in mind. So it has its anterior attachment on the posterior surface of the pubis here and then it attaches along the fascia of the obturator internus muscle and then at the back it attaches to the coccyx and it meets in the midline to form this midline raph. So this is where the, the levator ani meets in the midline posterior to the anus which is this um, aperture here. So anteriorly you can see that the levator ani muscle has this defect, it's got this u-shaped defect and this is called the urogenital hiatus and this allows the um, urogenital apparatus to pass through the pelvic floor into the perineum below. So in males you get the passage of the urethra and in females you get passage of the urethra and the vagina through this urogenital hiatus. And as you can see the muscle consists of various different um, fibres. So you've got these loops of fibres which loop around various structures. So the levator ani muscle is typically thought of in terms of three sets of fibres. So you've got the pubococcygeus which attaches from the bony bit of the pubis and extends back to the coccyx. So you've got the coccyx at the, at the back here. And then it's got some anterior, the anterior fibres of the pubococcygeus actually loop around the prostate in males and the vagina in females. So you've got these anterior fibres which are divided and loop around the prostate in males forming the levator prostatae or the puboprostaticus and in females it loops around the vagina forming the pubo vaginalis and then in the midline as I mentioned before connecting from the coccyx down to the anus so remember this is the aperture for the anus so connecting from the coccyx to the anus you've got this midline raph this ligament which is called the anococcygeal ligament or anococcygeal body and then the next part of the levator ani muscle is this puborectalis muscle so I'm going to draw this on in green, outline it in green and this forms a sling around the distal end of the gastrointestinal tract so around the sort of anus and rectum, around the anorectal junction so you've got this 
sling of muscle from the levator ani forming around the um, anorectal junction. So these are the intermediate fibers of the levator ani and they again originate on the pubis and they have the important function of maintaining this anorectal angle so they keep this angle of 90 degrees which closes off the anal canal and I'll come on to talk about this in a moment and then we've got the posterior fibers of the levator ani muscle and these are called the iliococcygeus muscles or fibers so you've got these which I'm outlining in purple so those are the three collections of fibers which make up the levator ani muscle so this muscle forms the bulk of the pelvic diaphragm so just to quickly recap the levator ani is composed of these three collections of muscle fibers and if we rotate the model around you can see the origin of the levator ani on the posterior surface of the pubis and then it's got this origin along the, the border of the obturator internus muscle. So covering the obturator internus is this fascia and you've got this thickening. So you can see this white thickening. This is a tendinous thickening called the tendinous arch and this is the thickening of the fascia where the levator ani takes part of its origin. And then over here we've got the ischial spine. So along this line from the body of the pubis along this tendinous arch to the spine of the ischium, the ischial spine, the levator ani takes its origin and then it inserts on the coccyx and in the midline at this anococcygeal ligament. So if we just rotate to an inferior view you can see these muscles taking their attachment on their little coccyx and you've got this perineal body which is a fibromuscular connective tissue node which joins the perineum and the pelvic floor and you've got some convergence of the levator ani muscles on this node. So the function of the levator ani muscle is to support the pelvic viscera and it keeps the rectum and vagina closed. So it has this kind of sphincter closing action on the rectum and the vagina. And importantly, it resists rises in intrapelvic pressure during any straining. So for example, during coughing, when the abdominal muscles increase the intrapelvic pressure, it resists this rise and prevents anything being evacuated from the digestive tract. So one thing I mentioned was that the puborectalis maintains this anorectal angle. So you've got this angle between the rectum and the anal canal. And the puborectalis loops around this and, and it keeps this angle. So by maintaining this angle, it sort of forms this valve which stops the anal canal filling with feces from the rectum. So when this muscle relaxes and releases its tension on this angle, the angle between the rectum and anal ca canal increases and it becomes more like this. So then you don't get this pinching off of the anal canal and feces can flow from the rectum into the anal canal. So this is important in defecation, so you need to be able to relax the pelvic diaphragm muscles, in particular the puborectalis portion of this muscle, in order to relax this anorectal angle and prevent shutting off of the anal canal. So the other muscle of the pelvic diaphragm is the coccygeus, which you can see here on either side. So this muscle lies over the sacrospinous ligament. So if I rotate it around to the back, you can see this ligament connecting the sacrum to the ischial spine. So it lies over the sacrospinous ligament. And it forms the posterior part of the pelvic diaphragm. So it originates on this ischial spine and it inserts laterally on the coccyx and the adjacent margins of the sacrum. So if I just rotate around to the back, you can see its insertion along the margins of the sacrum and the coccyx below. So this muscle um, functions to support the pelvic floor and it's innervated by branches from the anterior rami of S4 and S5. 
So the levator ani muscle is actually innervated by branches of the pudendal nerve from routes S2 to S4. So you've got that useful mnemonic, S234 keeps shit off the floor. So it describes kind of the function of the levator ani muscle. So we've talked about the pelvic diaphragm now in quite a lot of detail. So the next part of the pelvic floor is the perineal membrane and the deep perineal pouch. 